Hi, my name is Brent Dance. I'm a second year MBA student at the Tech School of Business at Dartmouth College and also an MBA fellow at the Center for Digital Strategies. I'm here with Patrick Bichette, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Google as part of the Brent Technology Impact Series. Patrick, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you for coming and welcome to Tuck. My pleasure. What a great time to be here. What is Google's view and perspective on, on big data? How does it look at all that information they do have access to and what kind of value do they see that, that data providing to their customers? Well, big data is really a phenomenon that starts when the convergence of the computing power, the storage, and the access comes together in this magical transformation that we've seen in the last uh, decade, where you know, today on my Nexus 4 phone, I have so much more power than we would have ever dreamt even five years ago. The benefit of big data is it gives you all this opportunity to create these magical moments throughout your day. And at Google, we see it as an immense opportunity to kind of help you live your day, take all that grunt out of the way so that you can really focus on the stuff that you really love to do. And that's why I think data, big data is a huge opportunity, both for us at Google, but also for all of our users. How does Google stay innovative and move at startup speed uh, as it grows bigger, as it dips its, its hands into more, more products and, and more services and industries? Google stays. Um, nimble by its mission. If you think of Google's mission, which is, you know, assemble, organize, make useful all of the world's information to your benefit, right, to the benefit of users to deliver these amazing services, um, we're just at the beginning. We're at maybe the first inning or the second inning of understanding all the possibilities of what this data can give you in terms of quality of life and, and products. So, the way to stay nimble is to look ahead at all the opportunity ahead of you and continually kind of set the bar higher and race for it. And that's what excites people. Who wants to kind of redo the same thing in like a second pastel color, right? When you can completely reinvent the entire field, the entire building, the entire environment around you. So by having these amazingly kind of stretch goals, what we call at Google, right, this healthy, Larry always talks about this healthy disrespect for the impossible. If you always have that in the back of your head when you actually set up your objectives, you always feel nimble because you're shooting for this thing that you kind of go, I don't know if I can do this, let's go, right? That's the spirit of Google and that's why I think we continue to have the velocity we have. I heard once from um, a current Googler who, who posted something and said, you know what, the reason why I'm so excited about Google is that I personally believe so much in, where, in what it's doing and how it's doing it and where it's going, and that's what makes all the difference f for me. And I, so I think that uh, what you said sounds like it really resonates with those that work, work there. Um, yeah, well. I think that there is there's a recognition that Google is, yes, we are a for-profit company. Like Nobody makes any mistakes about this. It's true. But we're also this incredibly innovative research center where we push the envelope on so many elements of the digital economy that, and then we're part of a social movement too. Like we have our values, we stand for open, right, as an example. And people who join Google and work with our, share our values. And so absolutely, these two other elements of this kind of research of pushing for like, amazing innovation and you know, standing for what opens mean, right? And making sure that the, open, the internet stays open and that information is available and freely available to everybody. A lot of people, you know, look at Google as, as being number one in many areas. And this may be, you know, similar to, to sort of our, our train of thought right now, but how does it maintain its, you know, how does it stay on top? How does it stay number one? Uh, does it always strive to be number one in everything? Or is, can, how, do, how does Google think about its, uh, its positioning? Well, I think that the best way to think about it is how we set our objectives. Because as I said a minute ago, we have this mission that is still completely unfulfilled in so many ways. And because we set ourselves objectives that are, you know, again, pushing the envelope of the near impossible, it, it enables us to actually not live in incrementalism. And it's what, the minute that you fall into, I want to improve by 10 to 15%, that's when you know you're on the slippery slope of death. Every time you look at something and you say, how do I do it 10 times more, 10 times better, 10 times faster, 100 times, right? I mean, Google Fiber, which is launched in Kansas City, 100 times faster than the average speed. You have to think it completely differently. And when you do that, it's not about 
staying number one or number two. It's about defining the space every mm. single time in a new territory that you go and run for. So, and by the time you get there, you ask yourself, okay, now if I can do a gig, why can't I do 10 gigs or 100 gigs, right? Which is going to be immediately the next question. And mm -hmm. so when you do mm -hmm. that, it's not about staying number one or number two. The real question is, what's the impossible goal I want to shoot for? And when I do it that way, right, I kind of set, you know, we set our own agenda on our own terrain rather than just comparing yourself as to, you know, you got a four inch screen or do you got a four and a half inch screen or a 4.2 inch screen or a 3.7 inch screen, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the right question, right? Yeah. The right question is, hey, instead of having a phone, why wouldn't I wear my phone and have Google Glass? That's how you actually, you know, keep the place alive and excited. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that is, it is very exciting. It's very exciting to, to hear and I, and I can see how, um, you know, how people would work very hard and work and be very, very, very focused and push push their own limits to the best um, when they're working in that environment. Uh, one kind of sp speaking of sort of working there, um, that would be nice to hear some of your own personal favorites. What your favorite aspect of your job? What do you enjoy most? Get most you know personally really challenged by and excited by? I have the perfect job to exemplify what Google is. My my title and my, my formal job is Chief Financial Officer at Google. Everybody knows that because that's my title. But just to describe my day-to-day -day job, right? I actually help leading not only our finance organization. And when I say lead, we have stupendous people. We have the best people in the world in so many of the areas we, I work in. But you know, our finance team is amazing. But not only do I have the responsibility of finance, I have the responsibility of our real estate all around the world. I also have the, the responsibilities of all of our employee services. So think of chefs cooking you lunch, or massage therapists, or bicycles. So all of these things. Also human resources, also the economics team, and then also the Google Fiber team. So I'm just giving you kind of a snippet of my day <laughs> job. And again, like if you think chief financial officer, you don't think Kansas City and Google Fiber, and you don't think of chefs cutting carrots, right? Organic carrots that you make sure are within 300 miles so that you know, we keep our carpet footprint. That's the scope of my That's very googly. At Google, the real question is, what really excites you? And where can you really push the boundaries in areas that you, know, you can go for 10x? So why I get up in the morning and I actually am pretty excited is I look at all these areas where I work with incredible people. And in each of these areas, we also have our 10x projects where we're pushing the envelope to kind of reinvent so many parts of it for the better. That, what's not to like? Yeah. Um, so I think it would be great to hear too is how you stifle bureaucracy and, and protect um, you know some of that some of that flat hierarchical decision making or experience that that entrepreneurs or those that, that are tend to be very creative need that kind of where they need that kind of environment to really operate in. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you maintain or keep that as as a personal leader and working with those that, that work with you? One of the key things I love about Google is our flat hierarchy. Yes, we're a bigger place than when we were a startup. We're not kidding ourselves. We're not a startup. We have the feeling of a startup, though, which means Googlers talk. Like I get emails. Everybody knows they can write me. And everybody writes me. <laughs> and I get all these emails all week long. And I get Google Pluses, and I'm posted. Patrick, have you thought of this? And have you thought of that? And we've got, uh, you know, I, I was you know, on a bicycle bumping into a bunch of people a couple of days ago when I was in Mountain View. And the next thing I know, right, there's a thread going on on Google+, right? Hey, Patrick kind of did this, and then, then I had to reply. When people know that you can, they can just kind of contact you. They can bump into you. They, they, they see you around campus, and they stop you, and they say, have you thought of this? I was thinking of that. How come I don't understand this? I mean, it just squeezes the place into, a, you know, we're all in this together. And then the minute you have that, right, then if there's something that's not working, you know instantly. They know that they have almost an obligation to let you know. And then when they let you know, you know, you fix it because it's us. It's not like there is no demand, right? It's, it's just us. And as long as we have things like TGIF where people can show up once a week, put their questions, and whoever, you know, as Googlers vote on, their, um, on the internet, we have our own internet where you put in your questions, people can vote. So the top question, whichever is on the mind of Googlers, goes to the top of the list. And that's the first question we're going to answer. We're not going to say, well, we're not going to answer that question. That's the first question we're going to answer, right? This transparency, this openness, and this squishing of hierarchy 
and this open communication, it still feels like a startup. And to me, I take immense pride in this kind of hunch that these Googlers all have everywhere in the world. Right? They'll just write, they'll write me from Asia. They'll write me from Europe. Right? They know I'm coming to Europe. They're like, oh, wow, you got to come and see this, right? Love that. I just think that that's part of the big magic of the place, and we're not going to lose it. That's wonderful, Patrick. Thank you for your time today. This has been phenomenal. I wish we had a whole lot more of it. But um, again, thank you for coming out. This has been Brent Dance at the Center for Digital Strategies at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. And uh, we hope you tune in and listen to us next time.